Like many immigrants, my parents came to the United States in search of the American dream. The American dream, as you all know, is a complicated, multifaceted concept that means different things to different people. But one key aspect of it is the idea that if a child works hard, they can uh, make a better living and, and do better than their parents did uh, and move ahead in life. And so I want to start by assessing the extent to which America lives up to that ideal of giving, chances, giving children chances of succeeding by looking at a very simple statistic that my colleagues and I computed in a paper we published this past year. So this chart here shows you the fraction of children who achieve the American dream measured in the following simple way. What fraction of children earn more than their parents did at a comparable age? And so you can see, looking at the left side of this chart, starting with kids born in 1940, that for children born in the 1940s and 1950s, it was a virtual guarantee that you were gonna achieve the American dream of doing better than your parents. 92% of children born in the 1940s earn more than their parents did. Now, if you look at how this pattern has evolved over time, you can see that for kids born in the 1980s, and in my generation, for instance, it's now become much harder to achieve that version of the American dream. It's essentially a coin flip, a 50-50 chance as to whether you will do better than your parents. And so motivated by that worrisome trend, which I think lies at the heart of a lot of the frustration that many people around the United States are expressing today, my colleagues and I here at Stanford are focused on understanding how we can revive the American dream. In what we're calling the Equality of Opportunity Project, we use big data to study how to revive the American dream. Now, this application of big data to social science and economic policy questions is, I think, one of the most important trends in research in our field. Much as big data is being used in the private sector, as you all know, to improve the products that, say, Amazon and Google are offering, our vision is that we can use big data to answer questions like increasing, how can we increase upward mobility in the United States? And so we analyze a range of interventions from childhood to adulthood, how the neighborhoods in which you grow up affect your chances of succeeding, how the schools you attend affect your prospects, how colleges play into upward mobility. The starting point for much of our analysis is that there are very sharp differences in children's chances of climbing the income ladder across areas within America. And so to show you that, I'm going to turn to this map here, which shows you the geography of upward mobility in the United States. The way we construct this map is take data on 10 million kids who were born in the early 1980s and assign them to different locations in the United States based on where they grow up. We divide the US into 740 different metro and rural areas. And in each of those areas, we take the set of kids who grew up in low-income families in the bottom fifth of the income distribution, and we ask what fraction of them made the leap to the top fifth of the income distribution. So think of the classic Horatio Alger version of the American dream. How likely are you to achieve that depending upon where you grow up? And what you can see in this map is that there's dramatic variation in your odds of climbing the income ladder depending upon where you grow up. In the areas in the darkest green colors, you have rates of upward mobility exceeding 16.8%. So just to give you a frame of reference, remember, of course, that no matter what you do, you can't have more than 20% of people in the top 20%, right? <laughs> so 16.8% is actually quite a high number. To put it differently, if we lived in a society where our parents played no role at all in determining our outcomes, we'd expect one-fifth of kids to rise from the bottom fifth to the top fifth. And 16.8% is getting very close to that. It's higher than any country in the world, essentially. So if you look at places in the Midwest, for example, or parts of the West Coast and Northeast, you have really very high rates of upward mobility, even for kids entering the labor market today. The American dream appears to be well and alive. On the other hand, if you look at the darkest red colors on this map, places like Atlanta or Charlotte, for example, those are cities that are viewed as having very vibrant economies with some of the highest rates of, rates of job growth in the US. But despite that, in Atlanta, if you're born into poverty, you have only a 4.5% chance of making it to the top fifth, lower than any country for which we currently have data. So even within the United States, there are some places that are truly lands of opportunity. And there are other places that are unfortunately better described as places of chronic poverty. 
Now, in this big map, your eye gravitates to the broad regional variation with much lower rates of upward mobility in the southeast relative to the rest of the country and so forth. But if we zoom in and take a look at the data, for example, within the Bay Area, so this is computing the same statistic that I showed you on the previous map, but now at the county level within the Bay Area. And what you see is that there continues to be a striking amount of variation even within narrow geographies. So for example, for kids who grew up in San Francisco in the 1980s, there was a remarkable rate of upward mobility of 18.5%, very close to that 20% max that I mentioned. In contrast, if you go over the Bay Bridge to Oakland, that number falls by nearly a factor of two to 11%. So even across relatively close areas, we find not just in the Bay Area, but across the United States, really sharp differences in children's chances of rising up. Now, naturally, uh, the, the question of interest to us as academics and to policymakers is why does upward mobility differ so much across areas? The key point I want to start with here is that most of the variation in upward mobility appears to be caused by differences in childhood environment. The way we reach that conclusion is by studying 7 million families who moved across areas in the United States. And rather than going into the statistical details of that study, I'm going to summarize what we find with a simple example. So let's think about a set of families that start out in Oakland. And just to pick a round number, imagine if you grow up in, from birth in Oakland, you have an earnings at age 30 of $30,000 on average. If you grow up in a low-income family, say, in Oakland. And now think about a set of families that move from Oakland to San Francisco, which as you saw on the map that I showed you, seems to have better outcomes for the kids who grow up there. So again, to pick a round number, suppose if you grow up in a low-income family from birth in San Francisco, you have earnings of $40,000 on average at age 30. So now let's think about a set of families that move from Oakland to San Francisco with kids of different ages, starting with families who move when their child was exactly nine years old. Why age nine? That happens to be the earliest age that we can look at in currently available data. So what we see with this point plotted here is that families who move when their child is exactly nine years old, if we track that child forward 21 years in our data and look at that child's earnings at age 30, we see that that child is about halfway between the kids who uh, grew up in Oakland from birth and the kids who grew up in San Francisco from birth. That is, that child is earning roughly $35,000 a year in this example. So that's for the kids who moved when they were exactly nine. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who moved when they were 10, 11, 12, 13, and so on. What, and what you see is a very clear pattern. The later you make that move from Oakland to San Francisco, the less of a gain you get. If you move after you're in your early 20s, you get essentially no gain at all, and the relationship is completely flat after that point. So I think there are three key takeaways from this chart. The first is that where you grow up really matters. It's not just that the types of kids who live in Oakland are different from the types of kids who live in San Francisco. Apparently, if you take a given child and move that child to a different environment, you see very different life outcomes for that child. I think that's a very encouraging message. It means that we can actually potentially solve this problem. Second, you see that what really matters is childhood environment. Moving as an adult doesn't do a whole lot for you. And third, you see that every extra year of exposure to a better environment in childhood helps you roughly equally. It's not just the earliest years that matter most. Moving as an adolescent continues to be beneficial. Now, naturally, the next question is then to ask, OK, we see that some places produce better outcomes for kids than others, and you know, uh, that's useful to know. But what can we learn from that in terms of how we might be able to increase upward mobility in the rest of the country? So we've looked at a variety of factors to try to understand what the characteristics of high mobility areas are. And I'm going to summarize here the five strongest patterns that we find. The first is that places that have less residential segregation, where low-income and high-income people, blacks and whites, are living closer together, where you have stronger communities in a sense, tend to have much higher levels of upward mobility. Now, there are many ways in which you can measure segregation. The patterns here are so stark that you can just see them visually. So let me give you an example. This map here illustrates racial segregation in Atlanta. The way it's constructed is that each person in Atlanta is represented by a dot, 
and the dots are colored so that whites are blue, blacks are green, Asians are red, and Hispanics are orange. And what you can see is that Atlanta is an incredibly segregated city. The blue dots are just in a completely separate part of the city relative to the green dots. Corresponding to that, Atlanta and cities that look like this tend to have some of the lowest levels of upward mobility in the United States. In contrast, if you look at Sacramento, you see that the colors are much more interspersed in Sacramento. It's a much more integrated city. And corresponding to that, <laughs> places that look like Sacramento have much higher levels of upward mobility in general. Now, going through a bit more quickly, the other strong patterns we find, we find that cities with a larger middle class, more people between the 25th and 75th percentile of the national income distribution tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. We also find that places with more stable family structures, for example, more kids being raised in two-parent families tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Related to that, we find that places with greater social capital, so for instance, Salt Lake City with the Mormon Church is thought to be a classic example of a place with a lot of social capital where someone else will help you out even if you're not doing well. Those kinds of cities tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. And finally, we find that places with better schools, as you might expect, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. So to wrap up, I want to talk about what we can make of this going forward and where our research team is headed. How can we design policies in light of these data and this evidence to increase upward mobility? The challenge here is that the data suggests that reviving the American dream, while we think of it as a national problem, really requires local action. So how do you prescri prescribe treatments when diagnoses differ so much across areas? There's going to be no one-size-fits-all solution. Our approach is to use big data to diagnose the specific barriers in each area. And we're working with local stakeholders and city governments, housing authorities, colleges, schools across the country to try to design customized solutions. You might think of this as the social science analog of precision medicine. So I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but this gives you a sense of the type of approach we're taking, focusing in this case on Cleveland, where we construct data that is specific to Cleveland, showing neighborhood by neighborhood in Cleveland which parts of the city offer the best opportunities for success, what indicators look like at various time points. We're working with local housing authorities to help low-income families move to the best areas that can help their kids succeed, while working with other local nonprofits and government stakeholders to figure out what kinds of investments can be made to improve the neighborhoods that are in greater distress. We're also in a separate strand of our research working with colleges including Stanford and many other universities across the country to figure out how we might be able to increase access to uh, higher education institutions for kids for low-income families and help them climb the income ladder. So let me conclude by coming back to the types of statistics I started out with. Children's chances of rising from the bottom to the top of the income distribution. One way you can look at these statistics is to take a pessimistic view and say, isn't it unfortunate that in America today, children born into low-income families really don't, on average, have that great of a chance of rising up and achieving the American dream? I look at it instead as a data that presents an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity is illustrated by the fact that there are places, even today in America, like Dubuque, Iowa, for example, where a remarkable 18% of kids rise from the bottom fifth to the top fifth. So that shows that we can solve this problem. The challenge for us as researchers and as scientists is to figure out what we need to do to revive the American dream in places that currently offer less opportunity. And the challenge, I think, for everyone here in the audience is to figure out how we can implement those solutions in your communities, in your schools, in your colleges across the country. Thanks very much.